All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming to our session. Um, th today we're gonna be talking about, uh, this panel is about enterprise adoption of Kubernetes and containers. My name is Chris Hodge. I, am, um, I work for the OpenStack Foundation. I work for the uh, marketing and trademark program as well as um, our um, community relations. Um, we have a fantastic panel here today. We'll just start from here and work down the panel here. Um, our first panelist is Adrian Otto. Um, Adrian's been part of OpenStack since the very beginning. He, was, he spent 10 years at Rackspace. He's been to every single um, OpenStack design summit and conference. Since that time, he's been the PTL of several projects, including Magnum, which is the container orchestration project uh, for OpenStack. Um, I'd like everyone to welcome Adrian. Hey, Adrian. <clears throat> Our next panelist is Jonathan Chang. Um, he leads a team of cloud solution architects at Comcast. Comcast was one of the early adopters of OpenStack um, and was, they were really deploying OpenStack at scale and um, delivering probably a lot of content that you, if you're a Comcast uh, uh, viewer, you've probably seen uh, content de delivered by them. Um, uh, he's definitely not an expert on containers or orchestration, but he is really excited about sharing his company's experiences and direction um, and, you know, to help you make decisions about how you want to deploy your infrastructure. So, um, you know, this, everyone say, uh, give Jonathan a welcome. Huh? Um, Tony Campbell is the Director of Educational Services at CoreOS, where he's responsible for training, certification, and general education around Kubernetes and CoreOS. Um, he's been a member of the OpenStack community since 2011, since he attended his first OpenStack Summit in Boston, and so this is a kind of a nice homecoming for him here. Um, he hasn't missed a single summit since. Um, before CoreOS, he was at Rackspace, um, you know, which is the company that co-founded OpenStack with NASA. Um, and he's excited to be here to talk about enterprise Kubernetes and enterprise OpenStack. Okay. Okay. And our final panelist is Bick Lee. Uh, Bick uh, is a co-founder of Platform9, which is, which is a OpenStack cloud provider in our ecosystem. Um, not only do they provide OpenStack cloud services, but they also provide an integrated uh, Kubernetes service. And so Bick will be able to uh, share his experience on providing uh, public cloud services in both uh, OpenStack and Kubernetes. And so everyone, welcome Bick. Oh. Okay, and one last thing before we begin the panel and uh, start asking the panelists some questions. We've set up an Etherpad for this session. If you're new to OpenStack, Etherpad is a way for you to work, uh, to take collaborative notes on a session. Um, so if you go to this URL that's at the top of the screen there, um, you should be able to kind of add your own questions, your own comments, your own notes, and these notes will be available after the panel and the conference is over too. So, um, so without much further ado, uh, let's, uh, let's begin. Um, so let's start by setting the stage a little bit. Um, and just, I would like all the panelists to kind of like share their experiences with um, uh, uh, both OpenStack and Kubernetes adoption right now and kind of, you know, their, their experiences with it so far. I guess we'll start with Adrian. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Thanks, Chris, for the great introductions. Kubernetes has got to be the hottest buzzword since OpenStack. <laughs> I could go on. <laughs> but there's a reason, and I think people are really excited about the, uh, the innovation of the container and the related technologies. And once you start adopting a microservice architecture for your applications, you start to discover that there's something missing, if you think the way you've been thinking about cloud for the last seven years. And what you'll find is that there needs to be something that coordinates all of those microservices together. And Kubernetes is really good at doing that, which is why it's so popular. So um, Comcast has been doing OpenStack f since the uh, early years. Um, we're one of the larger deployments in the United States. Um, and, and you know, part of the reason why we, we deploy OpenStack is, is that it takes really good advantage of, of one of our, our, our biggest strengths, and the strengths is our network. Now, when you apply that to containers and, and orchestration on top of a, a very robust network and, and potentially virtual or bare metal infrastructure, it starts making sense that we kind of deploy both. So that's kind of our story. Um, our video IP team 
has a fairly large Kubernetes deployment on bare metal servers using Docker containers for our uh, cloud digital video, video recording service and uh, encoding service. So we'll probably talk a little bit more about that later. Got it, Mike. Uh, so for me, I'm with uh, CoreOS. And for those of you who may not know about CoreOS, uh, we provide self-driving infrastructure for Kubernetes. Uh, so if you're running a Kubernetes cluster, um, things like etcd, uh, rocket, flannel, those are things that were invented at uh, CoreOS. So we've begun, to, we've begun to see a lot of customers coming to us from the enterprise who are interested in Kubernetes, but interested in running it on top of OpenStack. Uh, so we've begun development on installers and products to allow that to be ran on top of OpenStack. And then before CoreOS, I was at Rackspace, so I breathed OpenStack all day, every day. So um, it's kind of nice to be able to continue to work with this awesome community in my new role. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Big Lee. So um, Platform 9 started as an uh, OpenStack company. Uh, we provide a managed uh, offering for OpenStack. Uh, we call it SaaS-based. And uh, we were one of the first ones to do this. And for some reason, um, it's, uh, it seems to be a very popular delivery model now. I think this morning you heard of uh, remotely managed OpenStack, and, and that's, that's what Platform 9 is all about. Um, we started our Kubernetes journey based on pure customer demand. Uh, we had a large customer come to us one day, and, and they told us, we decided to write all of our new apps on the Kubernetes API. We're betting the company's future on Kubernetes. What do you have to offer? And, and that's when we decided, oh, we, we better get into this space. Um, today, we provide both OpenStack and Kubernetes side by side. Customers can run them together or just one of those stacks. Uh, and so we provide choice. And I can get into why we're uh, offering them side by side as opposed to one on top of the other uh, later. OK, thank you. Yeah, well, and I actually think that that kind of brings us to a really good question that, um, that I know that I get a lot. So I'm very involved with the Kubernetes community. And oftentimes, people will look at me and say, why would I want to run Kubernetes on OpenStack? Why wouldn't I just run Kubernetes on my bare metal? Um, so with the wealth of experience on the panel here, can, can everyone kind of share their experiences with that on Kubernetes on OpenStack versus Kubernetes on bare metal? Yes. <laughs> when you have a toy application, you can run it on anything you want. And then when you have a real application that needs to manage infrastructure, you realize that container orchestration software like Swarm or Kubernetes or Mesos, are not designed to manage infrastructure to the extent that a system like OpenStack is. So these are complements, not substitutes. So I think of these as a, a set that overlaps in the middle. But you've got like infrastructure as a service is over here. You've got container orchestration over here. Um, and there's, a, there's a bit that overlaps in the middle, but they, uh, they support each other. So for example, if you want to be able to dynamically create storage volumes or networks and connect those up to your applications and have that all work well, um, you're going to have some trouble if you're using Kubernetes by itself because the, the driver ecosystem hasn't developed yet to an extent where you have lots of supported choices uh, to get those things done, whereas OpenStack in combination with Kubernetes gives you the, um, the capability to do both of those things. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, Today, Kubernetes is uh, optimized to run on public clouds. Um, if you try to run Kubernetes on-prem and you try to deploy one of the examples in the um, uh, Kubernetes repo, a lot of those examples will fail because they'll try to allocate a, a persistent volume or they'll expose a service that needs to be uh, exposed ex externally using a load balancer and when you're doing Kubernetes on-prem and you're missing all of those pieces, the app isn't just, just isn't going to run. And so um, uh, I agree with uh, what um, Adrian just said, and that is those missing pieces, the infrastructure, the storage, the load balancers, those are things to where I think OpenStack can help uh, fill those gaps. It's, it's definitely a common question that comes out, and I think you have to look at the application that you're trying to deploy in this environment. If you are super sensitive to performance, 
Uh, you might say, hey, I'm gonna go bare metal and get rid of the VM overhead, right? But if your app has some tolerance for performance, there's a lot of great benefits to running on top of a cloud, particularly when it, become, when it comes to adding nodes and, and doing some other things that are just automated. We are all used to working with infrastructure through cloud APIs and whatnot. So being able to do that on a cloud provider is very compelling. Um, but if you drop down to bare metal, yeah, it's possible. You just got to do some more plumbing. So we do do it on bare metal for the purposes that Tony brought up. And coding is a very CPU intensive process. And uh, we run very specific hardware to do encoding. Imagine multiple nodes inside of a 2U form factor. And so, you know, it wasn't a simple task kind of being on the leading edge of that kind of stuff. They started, the Viper team started this effort more than about two years ago. When, uh, can, you, can, can you describe some of the challenges you faced? Maybe you know in that in that. I mean, are, are they what what people what they've all described? Essentially, all the things that uh, Tony and, and Big talked about: load balancing and, and networking and, and and just the the general what Adrian said: the general immaturity of those states in Kubernetes today, uh, and and having to kind of invent those things and and, and learn by in production. So, 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 so building on the bare metal, you, you had to build those solutions yourself or did you wind up drawing from other open source projects? Um, definitely drawing from other open source projects, but, but you know, at, at the state it's in, you're right, there's a maturity issue, but there's also the benefit to be gleaned from, from running on bare metal, so that, that was kind of the... So what if there were an OpenStack project that allowed you to run Kubernetes on top of bare metal infrastructure? Would that be something you'd be interested in? <laughs> And Mag I think Magnum I, I, 101 this afternoon. Yeah, yeah. So, so what Adrian is talking about is uh, so Magnum is a is an open is an OpenStack project which is designed to run um, Kubernetes on top of an existing OpenStack infrastructure. Traditionally, this has been running on top of virtual machines, but um, Magnum, I guess the newest releases, is also tuned to run on top of bare metal. Yeah, it's it's an agnostic to the actual yeah. Nova instance type. So by default, it's whatever your Nova driver is. Right, but, but, but it will still take advantage of your, your network um, infrastructure that OpenStack provides and your storage infrastructure and these sort of things that are, that are, that are there. Um, so having, having said all of this, you know, now that like, all of you have used Kubernetes in, in, in production, how, what is that experience like? like, what, like what, is the, what is the experience of running Kubernetes in an enterprise environment where you're providing services, um, you know, in terms of scaling, stability, and even security? Yeah, I'll tell you, um, I've told this to my team, the thing I love about Kubernetes, and I'm simplifying it, but a lot of it just works, which I thought was really amazing. A lot of times we, we grab some open source software and you have to do a lot of hacking to kind of get it to do what you want it to do. So Kubernetes has its issues, but for the vast majority of it, it, it works. And um, I'll confess, I am a, a software developer by trade, so I, I hack on software. And Kubernetes allows me to focus on my application, uh, use the APIs. I don't have to get waist deep in infrastructure where I'm not as, as strong. So it allows me to be able to just to do that um, in a very simple way. So I love it for that reason um, and super excited about seeing how it works with OpenStack and maybe Magnum and pulling that all off. As far as for enterprises go, I'm just sorry, I'll be quick. Um, you know, Kubernetes is not for every application. In the case of what we're doing for, for encoding and, and DVR, it makes sense. It's a single tenant in 10 different data centers. We're not trying to deploy a variety of applications, a very simple one-dimensional application. Um, but then you start thinking about other workloads, like people want to do Hadoop or Yarn, and you're, you've got you know, kind of these inception problems where you're trying to build a scheduler on top of a scheduler. And so it's not quite there for everything yet. Um, so that's, that's kind of my enterprise take on it. Yes, yeah, so the question was around running um, applications of Kubernetes in production. And I guess there are several topics and angles we can look at. Um, in terms of, uh, let me bring up one angle, and that is for us just to operate the, the Kubernetes cloud, right, in, in production. Um, our experience with OpenStack was that it's, it's pretty hard to, to keep a, a cloud running, right? And um, for some reason, we thought Kubernetes would be simpler, more lightweight, easier. But um, it turns out that it's, it's, it's just as hard. <laughs> um, you know, Kubernetes is a deep, layered stack 
with storage network, the Docker engine, and then the Kubernetes layers themselves. And um, things can break and they do break. And when they do break, uh, pinpointing the problem is actually pretty challenging. And so um, uh, from uh, maintaining the health of uh, Kubernetes cloud, it's, uh, it, it's, it poses um, challenges just like it does on the OpenStack side. Yep, complex systems are complex. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. One of the cool things that I think is coming out of the Kubernetes community, though, is around operators and being able to take that operational expertise to maintain, to scale, to upgrade, and to build that into code so that you can treat that just like you treat your applications in Kubernetes. So I know that's still early on, but I love the way this community is kind of pushing the envelope in that direction. But, but, I, th but I think this also brings up you know, kind of an interesting idea of like, I, I think in the last year or so, we've seen, um, you know, with Stack and Eddie's, you know, as being one of the leaders in that, but more, more and more projects and more and more enterprises are starting to use containers as a deployment strategy for OpenStack. Um, kind of keeping that in mind, what are the things that the Kubernetes and the OpenStack communities can really learn and leverage from one another? Because it seems like that there are opportunities um, to learn from each other and use each other's technologies to kind of ease these burdens of, of upgrades and management and kind of keeping services alive and around so that all of your users can have a seamless experience? That's a tough one. <laughs> um, so when you have a cloud native application and you want to upgrade it, uh, you can do a rolling upgrade across your application. And if your infrastructure is arranged in a distributed way you, and it has versioning support built into it, then you can do the same thing. Um, but it turns out it's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, the Magnum team has been trying to put in place upgrades for existing clusters um, for over a full release cycle, and we'll be going into the next release cycle figuring that out for all the different um, drivers that it supports. And what works really well now is if, you're, if you take the YAML descriptor, right, the, the description of your application, the pod file, and you use that in order to deploy your application, you can create a new cluster and deploy your app into the new cluster, and that could be your upgrade strategy. But if you don't want to do that, if you don't have the capacity to, to move from one to another and skip, right, and you need to upgrade it in place, uh, then it requires a more complex um, upgrade strategy. The good news is that Kubernetes recent versions have added support to do that thing um, as a built-in feature. So this problem is getting less and less um, dramatic over time, but it's still, it's still not a snap your fingers and you're upgraded. You need to do it in a certain order. You need to understand what you're doing in order to successfully upgrade a cluster. I mean, to piggyback on that too, upgrades are really important, um, particularly from a security perspective. Keeping things updated is real important to keep your cluster secure, so we have to streamline that process. And there's a ton of work being done in the community. I know for CoreOS, that's one of the things that we're mainly focused on, is being able to push updates out to these clusters to keep them patched and secure. Yeah, uh, I agree with all of those points. Um, today, the... Um the best practice way to upgrade a cluster is, I think, to do a rolling upgrade of, of the nodes, and that um, performs a, a clean uh, drain of each node so that pods get terminated and, and rescheduled um, somewhere else, uh, which is great for applications that are designed to tolerate node failure. But I don't know if we're going to get into application compatibility and what kind of stuff runs well on Kubernetes. but. Not all applications may be designed like that, and so you know, depending on how you've done your application, it, it could experience some downtime. So, uh, I believe um, uh, Kubernetes and the Kubelet are being is being evolved to allow pods and containers to continue running um, across an upgrade. So perhaps that will uh, result in a better uptime for for applications. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it seems like running OpenStack on top of Kubernetes is almost a perfect stress test because it's highly stateful. Like, you can't get beyond, if you, you're, you're, you're managing machines and, and data and, there's, and, and databases and there's so much state there that, that the, I mean, to me, it's almost like you can't be able to run these services successfully without managing the state. And yet, somehow, we're, 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 there are projects out there that are, that are running OpenStack on top of Kubernetes and, um, you know, and, and finding ways to, um, you know, using Kubernetes strategies for, for, for managing and upgrading, um, yeah. you know, OpenStack projects. And this, and this morning we saw, um, 
you know, another project which is, you know, attempting to manage Kubernetes clusters across many different cloud providers. Right. Um, uh -huh. um, in terms of running OpenStack on Kubernetes, there's a lot of projects that, that attempt to do that. Uh, Cola, uh, Stackanetes. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's harder <laughs> than it sounds. We, we also have been on a journey to try to migrate our OpenStack uh, deployment process to to run on Kubernetes, and we've started, but we're we're nowhere near the end. And um, one of the challenge is um, when people think about an application, sometimes they think about just the, the program that runs. But where we think, where we found the the challenge is how the application is configured, okay? If you've invested a lot in custom tools or scripts or Ansible playbooks to configure your application, containerizing it requires you to kind of rethink how you do configuration, and that, that it turns out to be one of the biggest obstacles that we've faced, yeah. It might be worth it. Um, but I want to revisit a point that you made earlier, Vic, which is when things go wrong, if you have a very complicated system. You might only have one or two human beings in your organization that understand it well enough to be able to diagnose and successfully uh, solve the problem. And so I would be well, cautious to recommend to somebody to yeah. run Kubernetes OpenStack, Kubernetes, you know, like yeah. this well, Kubernetes sandwich well, thing. I think, I, I think I, I, but, but I think it's interesting because, because one of the, the, the premier Kubernetes provider out there is, I think, you know, would, would be Google, Google um, Container Engine. Um, which is running on top of a virtualized infrastructure, which is running on top of a containerized infrastructure. Um, and you know, one of the questions that came in from the audience here is, um, you know, what is the VM overhead? But there's, but but I think, you know, more generally speaking, what is the complexity overhead? A, a response to that is, one answer is you can wind up with competing schedulers. Yeah. Um, you know, so 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 the so the the complexity. How is the, like, for application stacks that are meant to help us all. Manage our complexity and simplify it. How does how do operators manage the complexity of, of merging these two systems together? Well, what I've seen is they don't attempt to auto scale the infrastructure layer, right. and they don't. So they do, they are not exercising the scheduler simultaneously. They pre-allocate mm -hmm. resources and then they allow Kubernetes to manage the static resources that have been allocated to it, and they don't try to have that thing do bin pack and and schedule simultaneously the application layer and the infrastructure layer because they're not coordinated tightly enough. Um, a lot of people want to do that because there's a potential cost savings to, especially if you want to do this like on top of a, on top of a third party cloud. Um, but I just don't see it in production today. Have you guys seen it? No, I agree. I, I've seen the infrastructure layer is still manual when it's, when it's upgrading the infrastructure layer. The application, yeah, totally API and everything, but when it comes to adding nodes to my cluster, still manual. Personally, Comcast has had enough challenges with OpenStack that <laughs> running a, a sandwich is not a good <laughs> premise for us. Yeah, and it's tricky, I think, too, because I think um, Kubernetes has nailed stateless apps, right? Got that easy peasy. And, and now we're working on stateful apps. You have things like stateful sets and things like that, but it's still early on uh, with those technologies, so there's still work to be done. It is doable. There are people doing it, running databases and whatnot, but it's, it's, not, um, it's not for everyone. So stateful sets are, are, are we're, we're, we're building state into Kubernetes um, and uh, breaking some of our, our cloud native principles, uh, you know, in doing it. But it's, but it, it look, but it's part of where the, where the future is going. And, and, you know, as we kind of get closer to the end, um, I kind of get, I want to get a sense of what everybody's thoughts on the field, you know, what, what, how, what direction do you feel the future is going in? And, and, and where do you see these, the, these, the relationship between these, you know, sometimes competing, sometimes complementary technologies? I think if you've got a cloud-native application that's greenfield, you're going to put it in Kubernetes, and it's going to be great. The, the trick comes once you've got all of your greenfield applications happily running cloud-natively, um, stateless or not, um, then you start to run into, OK, you've got this giant long tail of traditional applications that are in your infrastructure, and you're tempted to put them into this new, uh, this new world. And you're going to start to question whether they fit or don't fit. Um, and I think there's a huge opportunity to make it easy to lift those old applications in. And when you do, um, you shouldn't expect them to behave like a cloud-native application. They're going to still behave like a, like a legacy application, 
um, but they're going to be slightly more portable. So looking to the future, one interesting trend that I'm observing is these legacy virtualized applications. Some people are asking the question, hey, we love the Kubernetes API. Would it be possible to use the Kubernetes API to manage my old VMs? And um, we were joking about it a few weeks ago, but then we started uh, looking around, and there are several open source projects that, that have um, uh, started. and. Uh, at the last KubeCon, uh, uh, Red Hat uh, gave a very intriguing uh, presentation and demo about how to model virtual machines in Kubernetes using things like third-party resources. And um, that, that's a potentially um, very interesting development in, in how to bridge the, the, the legacy apps and, and the new stuff. Yeah, for us, um, our adoption of Kubernetes is going to be very tightly coupled to uh, the integration of IPv6, and right now, I, we feel like it's fairly nascent. Um, but you know, as far as greenfield goes, that's that's about our extent of it. It will be greenfield. It will be IPv6, and um, yeah, and not in the way that that kind of IPv6 is replacing v4, but really taking advantage of all the capabilities of v6 in a in a very v6 native way. And that, that's, that, that's interesting, too, because sometimes it feels like Kubernetes is very I, IPv4-centric. I mean, the idea that you have your, you have local host and you're netting and you're, and, and, you're, and you're kind of doing these things. Do you see improvements in the technology there between, you know, um, the, 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 the sort of shifting um, data packets versus direct addressing of your application containers? We, we hope so. I mean, we see our network becoming v6 only in, in, in the next few years. We're, we're making, com, you know, extreme strides towards that and um, it just right now the community is, is accelerating in a lot of things but that's an area that that we think you know that's there's a lot to be done there and there's a lot of benefit that we can glean from there and the reason I'm bringing it up is if there are a lot of uh, nodding heads out there they can they can kind of join forces and maybe we can accelerate that aspect of it as well uh, so for me I think the future looks a lot like operational expertise being captured in code. Uh, that's a lot of what we're doing around operators, um, being able to make it where an, an operator doesn't have to get up in the middle of the night to do a, a maintenance window for an upgrade, but it's all done in code. Um, and one of the, the steps that we're taking towards that path is even how we install Kubernetes is Kubernetes on Kubernetes. Uh, so we're actually running the control plane within Kubernetes itself, which is this crazy inception sort of deal, but not there's the a, Kublet. Uh, not the Kubelet. Not the Kubelet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it's the control plane. Um, and we use BootCube to pull that off, um, but that allows us to scale API nodes, schedulers, uh, just like we would uh, scale other apps, and allows us to walk towards building out these operators where we can do things like Prometheus um, or etcd, and we're able to do those pro programmatically to upgrade them and to push updates to them. So I think that's what the future is, is kind of heading, and more and more apps like that up the stack. Um, so um, I was going to, in the last few minutes, um, we, we had a few more questions from the audience. We actually had someone from the new stack who just asked a question in here saying, kind of asking, um, is, there, is there relief um, that Kubernetes is kind of filling this application role, um, you know, that maybe OpenStack isn't filling? You know, do, do, you, do you have feelings about, you know, any, any, any thoughts about that? You know, the, 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 you know, that there's them as complementary technologies and, and uh, you know, and, the, and, and how those are competing? Okay, I'll, I'll bite. <laughs> um, I do think, I do love the way that the OpenStack community and the Kubernetes community are, are collaborating with each other. I know there's a lot of talk out there about them competing and, and one destroying the other and things like that, but that's not the approach I'm seeing taken by the two communities, which I think is extremely healthy. Um, you kind of alluded to it earlier, Chris. I think there's a lot of things that the Kubernetes community can learn from OpenStack, and a lot of things OpenStack can learn from the Kubernetes community. Um, I do know as a software developer, Kubernetes makes things very easy, and the interface is very simple, but I don't have to take care of it at night, or I don't have to, you know, maintain it. Um, so I think for someone coming from an operator perspective, I'm sure they have a lot more to say around OpenStack and the strengths that it brings to the picture. I, for one, am relieved. <laughs> so I founded a, an OpenStack project called OpenStack Solem, which was pre-Kubernetes, and it was designed to try to address this gap 
and it's a tough gap to fill. Um, and I think that if OpenStack expanded its ambitions to try to solve all of those issues as well as all of, all of the infrastructure related ones, that focus would be diverted too much. And I didn't always feel that way, but I feel that way now and I'm glad. Yeah, well, and, and I think you see it maybe in the architecture of Kubernetes too, where so much of it is dependent upon providers for clouds to provide, you know, you know, to provide services, recognizing that you, you have strengths and that you can play to those strengths and that you can hand the strengths off to other, um, to other experts who, you know, are, are doing, you know, who are also providing a value to the community. I think is a, um, you know, I know that, I know that in my interactions with the, you know, you know, having kind of, you know, grown a lot of my career in the OpenStack community, but also, you know, um, uh, you know, beginning to work more and more with the Kubernetes community. I'm excited about the, I'm excited about how, you know, the, the possibilities of them together. And um, I think that we've reached the end of our panel discussion here. Um, so if there are any final words from our panelists um, as, we, as we kind of close out this session. Yeah, if you'd like to know more about the Magnum project, uh, there's a Magnum 101 session later today. No, I think this was a, a great discussion. Um, you know, m many years ago at, at these uh, Kubernetes conferences, there was a, always a joke about we don't want Kubernetes to turn into OpenStack, right? And I think they were referring to maybe to the the, the breadth and the depth of the ecosystem and, and just just the the size of it. But guess what? It, it looks like Kubernetes ecosystem today it's evolving into something that's just equally big and complex. So it's. Um, the, the two the two ecosystems are overlapping, and that's uh, that 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 truly is happening. So it's unclear how it's all all going to end, but th that's what I'm observing. Yeah. Coop Cuddle or Coop CTL? <laughs> CTL. <laughs> I say control. <laughs> yeah, there's um there's a lot of parallels you can draw. I'm agreeing with Big here between how OpenStack started and, and how Kubernetes is, is kind of adopted right now. And, and I think um, I heard Amit Tank call it developer hubris, but we see a lot of decisions being made based on the new hotness and not so much um, really if, 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 one, if one technology is fulfilling capabilities that another isn't. It's not so much about that. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming to the session. And um, a big round of applause for our panelists. Um, and we, we hope you have a fantastic week. Thanks for coming.